Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from Iowa Catholic Radio's Mercy Live Up Studios. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you live from these United States of America, myself here in warm, strangely, for one day, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm in the Iowa Catholic Radio Mercy Live Up studio, Bo Bonner, director of the Zeta Institute for Foundation and Ethics and Leadership, and director of mission and ministry at Mercy College of Health Sciences. You can find us at ZetaInstitute.com and MCHS.edu. Bud, where are you at? What you do? The director of the National Institute for Newman Studies, and if folks want to go to newmanstudies.org, they can see all that's going on on our end here in Pittsburgh. Well, Bud, um, like I was saying here in Des Moines, we're going to have one day of Indian summer, as it's usually colloquial, colloquially called, right? It's been in the 50s and 60s. Today, it's 85, yep. and then it drops right back down into the 50s and 60s. It's sort of like just saying, Bud, the Cubs postseason, right? Where we get one day of the postseason and then they're gone. We get one day of Indian summer and then poof, all gone. Just just grabbing a team out of the air, bud, to make an example of. Well, I was thinking about this when I woke up this morning because I, I couldn't stay up late enough on the East Coast to watch the Cubs lose. Um, but, you know, like our good friend John Leonetti, who's, um, you know, a key figure at Iowa Catholic Radio, he guaranteed me in, in mid June, I think, that the Cubs were going to win the Central by, by at least 10. Four. Oh, ten I, games. Well, yeah, ten games at the beginning of the year. I think he came down to four, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I think he said less than four would be an embarrassment. But the the Brewers tied them or won the division on a on a playoff game uh, after the last day of the season. My feeling, though, Bo, is you know they're probably just setting their fans up so that another century from now. Yes. When they win their second world championship, it'll be a huge deal. So yeah, that's right. They know, like, the, the joy is in the anticipation. Right. And there's got to be some goat that's to blame that we have not yet heard of. That's probably true. As Cardinals fans, we're more about stability. We like our world championships every decade or so. But <laughs> I understand the Cubs like to stretch them out. Yeah, they just, like, really like making them sp- special. Hey, you know what? Within one game of making it to the playoffs, uh, I, I, I'm pretty happy as a Cardinals fan being that we fired some dude midway through. And uh, yeah, you know, so there's always next year. I will say this about baseball. Baseball is a huge investment for the wild card game to be one game. You know what I mean? Like, I, I almost I almost think they should make the wild game like card game best of three because for your whole season to come down to one game, it go to like, what was it? The 13th inning? Yeah. And it was <laughs> like late in the night. I was just all like, "Sports, sports is already a cruel mistress, but they've really maxed out how cruel it can be." No, no, I think baseball purists really hate it, and so so much of the um, decision making in sports is driven by like television considerations and fan interest. But you know, if you're going to talk about baseball as uh, as a game, I think it should be one. Um, one pitching rotation against another. So to have you got to have a series in the playoffs. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh well, it's uh, it's at least fun because it turned out our way. <laughs> oh, their tears are delicious. I I have no doubt. I mean, <laughs> it's true. We're we're petty folks. Let's <laughs> let's not get this right. Like the, the the back. There's a lot of talk in the back between Jeb and Deacon Tony, but none of them are are, are pledging to go talk to the microphone, bud. So okay. Yeah, we're safe. Yeah, we're safe. Uh, as always, ca- brought to you by Cartridge World. For instance. If uh, Cubs fans wanted to print out reams of information about where it all went wrong, that's going to take a lot of ink, bud. And, if you uh, need to send a sympathy card to your Cubs friend. Sympathy friends. cards to your Cubs friend. 801 73rd Street, Windsor Heights. That's the place to do it. Yep, 515-564-7400. They've got um, environmental printing. And uh, pickup and delivery are available for uh, business customers. Right. And then, um, as always, brought to you by Mercy College of Health Sciences. And, like, now that we can all bury the hatchet, both, you know, the Cubs and Cardinals, all of our seasons are over. Uh, On October 18th, that means you have plenty of time. You're not going to be watching playoff baseball to go to the Faith and Healing Series uh, that uh, was presented uh, for the public 
at Mercy College of Health Sciences. That starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, so October 18th, Dr. May Sim, uh, one of my former professors uh, who wrote her dissertation under the famous Alastair McIntyre. Um, she is writing on uh, comparisons of Eastern and Western philosophy, especially about how they understand health and also indifference to health. So uh, we, we'd really love to have you. There will be hors d'oeuvres there. Uh, it's always great to have faith in healing speakers on campus. Yeah, that sounds like a great time. I've been in the past, and it's usually um, a good time to meet other uh, Catholics in the area and also like uh, a lot of time for discussion afterwards and things like that. So it's always worth your while. If you want to pre-register so that we know what food to get, mchs.edu slash faith and healing, just spelled out faith and healing, mchs.edu slash faith and healing. Um, but speaking of someone that uh, we can all get around uh, today, a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, so someone who had it even worse, uh, and um, an a, a, a uncommon good all-star, Brandon McGinley is going to be back on the show. And I tell you, every time he's on the show, we come up with some weird uh, description of the Catholic faith. I think last time it was nasty rash Catholicism. So who knows what we have in store? It's always a fun time to have Brandon McGinley on uh, to see what sort of uh, crazy shenanigans we can get up to talking about the faith. But I think we're talking about individualism uh, and its pervasiveness this time around. Yeah, a couple points about Brandon. I mean, I'm guessing he's uh, one of the staunchest critics of the wild card because the um, <laughs> the Pirates have suffered terribly. Like. They won 100 games a couple of years in a row and faced just like Cy Young winners in their one game runoff. But in all, in more serious area, yeah, paradox of individualism. I think helping us to think about, you know, how do we, it's really going to get into the roots of the show with the common good and, um, ordering society in such a way that, um, that, that families and communities, um, can grow in really helpful ways. Well, this is the uncommon good with Bud Marr. Bo Bonner here. We'll be back after these messages. <laughs> But all sorts of stuff happened over the weekend. We had Christ Our Life. In fact, I see uh, messages from everyone that they had a great time so much so that they would love to hear things again. Contractually, we can't do that. But if you have questions about uh, maybe even Christ Our Life, but specifically Brandon McGinley, uh, you want to like uh, tweet in condolences to Cubs fans, you can always do that through the Zip Whip line. 515-223-1150. That's 515-223-1150. Or if you're John Leonetti and you're hearing this show and you realize that most of this is aimed at you and you want us to stop, Zip Whip Line. Z- Jed, Zip Whip Line. 515-223-1150. That's 515-223-1150. Hashtag UCG for the uncommon good if you want us to pay attention to it later. This is the uncommon good. Like I said, uh, dry your tears. Uh, baseball's over for most of us listening. We'll be back after this. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Every year, Blessman International leads teams of Central Islands on 12-day, all-inclusive experiences filled with life-changing personal interaction with the beautiful African children that we serve. Teams are forming now for 2019. Space is limited, so make a decision today to use your time to do something significant in the life of an African child. Learn more and apply for a trip today at www.blessmaninternational.org. Thank you, R&R Realty Group, for supporting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. R&R Realty Group is an Iowa commercial real estate owner and developer that provides services for all commercial real estate needs, including brokerage, interior space planning, real estate management, construction, and more. R&R Realty Group has been accommodating business expansions and real estate solutions since 1985, solving commercial real estate needs. R&R Realty Group, establishing long-term relationships built on trust. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Thank you, Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, for underwriting Catholic Women Now. As an authorized independent agent, Cindy's team can provide health insurance options from Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. Cindy Schulte at 1315 50th Street in West Des Moines or on the web at cindyschulte.com. 515 515- Two two six two one one one. Cindy and her team know health insurance. Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa is an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Products available at Farm Bureau Financial Services.
Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, we have with us an Uncommon Good All-Star. Brandon McGinley, you've heard him before twice on this show. Writer and editor. Uh, you've seen his writings in First Things, The Washington Post, The National Review. I think he has like a standing gig with a Scottish newspaper. Um, I'm always angry that when I read it, he writes like an American. I always thought he'd have to like throw in weird Scottish phrases, but he doesn't. Brandon, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks so much, Bo. They, they do they do change my spellings to British English. Though, oh, they do. Kinds, like favorite with a U and things like that. <laughs> Color with a U. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Real quick, we have to get this out of the way. Bud and I were talking about it at the top of the show. Um, we were maybe having too much fun that C- Cubs fan seasons were nixed in one wild card game. Um, we were going to give you a little bit of time to vent as a Pirates fan about what you think of the wild card being one game. <laughs> I, was it? It was three years ago, I think, <laughs> that we lost to the Cubs in a wild card game at home. Well, we we had three years in a row in the wild card game. Yeah. We won the first one, then we lost the next two, um, and all of them were at home. So we were actually the the team that was ahead in, in the old system would have gone straight into the playoffs. And so the first one was the Reds, and that was awesome, and we beat them, and then we almost beat the uh, beat the Cardinals. Yeah, almost. Then, I remember that almost part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the uh, and then it was um, and we ran into Madison Bumgarner uh, yeah. against the uh, against the um, the Giants, and then the Cubs year it was Jake Arrieta. So we were like a couple games ahead of them, and Jake Arrieta shows up at PNC Park, and a friend had tickets, and I was there, and it was the most frustrating thing. I was <laughs> so mad because it was it's one thing to lose a wild card game, but it was also clear that was probably the best Pirates team we were going to have for yeah. a long time. And the Cubs were up and coming, and it was clear they weren't ready to win yet, and they swept us out of our one. Your one chance. <laughs> I was really, I wasn't happy. And so I mean, Brandon, to have, have right last night. Yeah, to have seasons like that and then face um, Bumgarner and Jay Carrietta in one right, game right. runoffs. Now, to be fair, I really thought this might have been the Cardinals' year, not because we had a good team, but like this is exactly the sort of like dirty, slimy team that like just barely gets into the wild card and then goes wins the World Series because that's, right, right, that's how right. we've done it the last two times. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, baseball, baseball. Well, speaking yeah. of deep cuts and thinking about, like, things that have happened around 2013, um, <laughs> Bud, Bud was like, hey, Bo, when we have Brandon back, we should talk about this article. He, he said, have you read the article about him and individualism? And I was like, no. Well, he was referring to an article that you wrote before I even knew who you were. Uh, <laughs> and so you pointed out that this was like a deep cut Uh, it's like if someone says they want to listen to a pink floyd song and you bring up pipers at the gates of dawn which if you are younger than me you probably don't even know that that's a pink floyd album uh and if you're younger than uh, some other people like jeb here you're probably like who's pink floyd point being (laughs) is uh your this article that you wrote uh for uh fair forward about individualism I think to Bud's credit, it's almost like you're a prophet, maybe, and you accidentally <laughs> wrote about all sorts of stuff that was happening in 2018. Where did you get your time machine device, Brandon, and why are you only using it to write uh, blog posts? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how the, the discourse about liberalism, which is really what the article is about, um, the, the article is called The Paradox of, The Real Paradox of Individualism, and and on the one hand, like you said, it seems to have the the the, the kind of discourse about individualism and and um, group identity and the state and how that all plays in with liberalism is extremely important right now. On the other hand, look, when I look back at the article, it, it feels that like like it was from a million years ago. Not so much because of what I wrote, a little bit because of what I wrote, but in part because of what I was responding to, which was a professor um, from Rutgers, a law professor from Rutgers, who was writing about um, how uh, the, benign, the, the benign liberal state can ensure uh, individual uh, autonomy for all. And, and when I was thinking about that and just, just how, how time-stamped that must be between 2008 and 2016, um, when uh, Barack Obama's president and left liberals are see, see, see Obama and people like him as an interminable future of liberal, of kind of benign liberal governance, forgetting totally about all the people who are being left behind uh, culturally and economically. But 
you know, for for a, a certain kind of of of, uh, of kind of Democratic Party liberal, this looked like this this kind of benign um, you know administrative state uh, seemed like it was going to ensure, in their view, individual autonomy forever, and they could speak so floridly about the the beauty of the of the liberal state. And now, of course, the discourse has totally shifted. Um, the state has seemed to have been captured by this by by precisely the forces that they thought um, the force of forces of uh, what they would call clannishness and, um, um, and in fact that was the the name of the book that I was I was responding to was the the rule of the clan uh, and uh, it's just it's fascinating to see all this playing out now five years later yeah and especially with like what's obvious in the news with like nominations and stuff like that real quick right. though. Um, speaking of post, which one do you think aged more strangely? That one or that picture you showed? Like, I think you're a high school senior, and there's like an American flag behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my um, yeah, my high school portrait. Yeah, I was. You I were was like running for that. office out of high school. Basically, basically, yeah, I was inspired by all this talk of high school, uh, high school yearbooks to go back and take a look at mine, and I was reminded of of just how uh just how dopey i looked with my uh american flag on a rustic barn in the background and it was uh, well i had spiked uh, hair and a guitar so i think you 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 win <laughs> so i guess i guess i win for being like you know extremely mainstream and bougie but <laughs> <laughs> no brandon i think what you're talking about these kind of developments in our society it really it it ties in just wonderfully with like what we keep trying to come back to on this yeah. show, and part of it is, you know, Christians use the language of freedom. We say, like, for for freedom, Christ has set us free. Or, you know, like, um, mm-hmm. uh, St. Paul, especially in relation to freedom from sin. And and you, you, you're you talking about um, Mark Wiener's article about the paradox of individualism, and he says, you know, part of one of the goals of a liberal society, or maybe its central goal, is to maximize individual autonomy. And I guess for our listeners, like, how as Christians, like, this seems one area as we navigate the world that, like, sort of ideas can seep in, and they sound close to the Christian vision of life, but something different's going on. Like, why why would Christians, in a sense, be resistant to this idea that, like, one goal of society is to maximize individual autonomy? Yeah, and that's something that is, that is like you said, it's seeped into all of our consciousnesses, such that it has become basically... Uh, it's just an assumption. It's just an assumption we have that that is that is what a good society does, and um, and the the problem I guess put put at its most basic level was that it's not ordered towards anything. Um, the Christian vision of freedom is ordered towards Christ. It's ordered towards virtue. It's ordered towards the good. It's ordered towards the common good. Um, and uh, whereas if you were to well, it gets a little complicated, but if but uh, for someone who is who's like a really doctrinaire and and consistent liberal like Mark Weiner who wrote this article, um, you know he would resist, I believe, any kind of of teleological any cor- any sort of mm. definition of of autonomy that would be ordered towards anything because that would put limits on people's autonomy. The problem is is that that's impossible. Uh, everybody has some sort of a notion of yep. what the good is and what they're pursuing and what other people should pursue. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, another of the paradoxes of liberalism, not so much, well, it's part, I guess, partly a paradox of individualism, um, is that the liberal state will, all, will always be pursuing some kind of good. You just see this in, I mean, the classic example in the past few years is stuff like, you know, same sex marriage and, and what, um, and, you know what is the extent to which you should be allowed by the liberal state to dissent from that to the extent that it might impinge on other people's pursuing their own goods and at the end of the day the liberal state's going to come down in some way or the other um and affirm somebody's good and deny somebody else's um somebody else's vision of the good um and so um and so the the question then becomes not should we should we form and and nurture a state that pursues some vision of the good or one that is neutral? Because neutrality is impossible. And so the question then is, you know, which which version of the good of the common good 
are we going to are we going to pursue? Well, and I think that you know, and, and I, <laughs> but and I have tried meticulously not to try to like wade into um, the the Supreme Court nomination hearings because that's sure. just a way to make all sorts of people mad. But I will say this about it: indicative of what you're pointing out is it's real easy to imagine a sort of neutrality and sort of a better way that rests above the fray. You know, like, oh, well, we're just going to, like, float above this sort of clannishness and have this better way where we just maximize people's freedom. Well, if there's not a better example of clash of freedoms and people trying to strive for what they want, I don't know what, like, this whole episode is. And what it shows, right, is now you have two diametrically opposed group of people that don't trust each other for a whole host of reasons, and right. now because we have this sort of like big lie circulating that like governance or uh, the good or anything like that sort of is free floating above the sort of like embodied structure of things, all we have left now is clanism. Like all we have now left is for people to basically say, I'm not going to believe the other side because they're the other side. There is no reasonable way to imagine how you would get yourself out of this sticky situation because we don't have things like customs. Uh, yeah. we, we, we did away with them. We don't have the sort of like bulky intermediate institutions where we would say like, okay, well, when it comes to an intractable situation, we fall to this or that, or we've done this for a long time. Um, it, it's just one of those sort of deals where you take Joseph Bottoms metaphor that like, uh, when you clear out the nests of the, the swallows of Capistrano, they don't come back. Like there's not, mm -hmm. you, you get away from all that stuff. All there is is sort of naked clanism and what do people want to rely on? If you're going, like, custom can seem clunky and even sort of, like, silly or even backwater. And you can imagine all of this, like, smooth operation if you just got rid of all of it. But this goes back to something like uh, A Man for All Seasons. If you clear all that out of the way, then the devil has a free shot, too. And I don't yeah. know if there's anything, a better way to describe what's going on, except that the devil and the demons have free shots at all of us because we've believed this lie about how we could have a more efficient, liberal, free, uh, no squeaky wheel type life together. Right. Right. And that's, and it's unnatural. And that, that I think, that I think is the, is the thing that I didn't see five years ago, but that is much clearer now is that, is that, you know, the problem, the problem with, um, with the, the kind of the administrative state liberalism, that Mark Mark Weiner, the the Rutgers professor, was was um, was discussing, uh, was arguing for, is that um, in aiming for individual autonomy, it actually makes the future that he lamented, the future of the rule of the clan, most likely, um, and actually the way to uh, to to kind of sublimate those kind of clannish um, uh, tendencies. Is to allow people a freer hand in uh, developing their own uh, communities and institutions and structures that are, if not outside of the, the the purview of the state, are at least given a freer hand by the state. And um, and the reason that, the reason I say that, and, and it's become clear, you know, over the past few years, as this as uh, um, racial and and now with now you we're seeing again not not to dwell on it, but with the Supreme Court stuff, uh, gender identity, not gender identity in the sense of you can pick whatever gender you want, but gender identity in the sense that um, men are developing uh, a kind of men's identity political consciousness um, that uh, um, that I think is going to be a huge factor going forward. But the sense of people dividing themselves into identity and interest groups, um, that is, on the one hand, part of being human. But on the other hand, doesn't have to totally dominate our political life. But now it is precisely because we've cleared the field of any other identities. The idea that we can all be, like you said, this kind of undifferentiated mass of, of autonomous individuals who are all making our way for ourselves. That's not that's not the way human beings have ever lived. Uh, we, by our very nature, form communities of interest. We, by our very nature, uh, are, I mean, just goes to the most basic anthropology of Aristotle. You know, we are a, a political people. We are a political, um, be, we're political beings. We're social beings. And when you deny that, it doesn't make that go away. And uh, when you deny that, what is often ha what often happens as is happening now, I believe, is that we are indulging that in a less healthy way. We are 
finding um, and enforcing uh, identities uh, and political identities and cultural identities um, as being mutually exclusive with others. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, to get theological about it, my view basically is that once you've, once you've cleared away the idea that we all share an identity as human beings made in the image of likeness of God, and then drilling down a little further, once you eliminate the idea that we can all share an identity in Christ in his church, then, um, then all that's left is, is, is people um, forming uh, identities that they believe are mutually exclusive, national identities and racial identities and gender identities and so forth. Um, and that uh, ultimately leads to precisely the, uh, the conflict and the clannishness that, the, that, the, um, that modern liberals have uh, tried to avoid with the mechanism of the state. Yeah, Brandon, at one point in your article, you say that like, what community is going to look like is, uh, I think you said like craggly and not straight lines. And, uh, yeah. and what I was thinking of is like beachheads. You know, if you let a beach mm-hmm. sort of grow on its own, then when the storm comes, it like sort of has a natural way of recovering. But like what we've done with like the entire eastern seaboard, right, is we've smoothed it. We've sort of made it where like everything's either pristine beach or a place that has a residence on it. And so then when the hurricane comes, it just wipes them out. Like there's no chance. It, it erodes the beaches. The, the, the sand is just eaten by the ocean, and I think that that's uh, sort of what you're getting at. But you had a question. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no. It was just fascinating to me that uh, Wiener in the article, when he talks about, like, if we don't have a robust state, we're going to be under the thumb of these different organizations, and he lumps together extended families, religious organizations, militant trade unions, racial gangs, and crime syndicates. And I'm thinking, you know, Cue the Darth Vader theme music. But um, you were kind of getting to this point uh, in your last response, Brandon. But you know, like, uh, there is a tension here because uh, as Catholics, we do recognize, like, there is this um, sort of tendency toward clannishness now. And we could recognize some of this, like, say, for instance, like, to, to use an extreme example, what happened in Charlottesville last year. Mm-hmm. And, and yet we're, we're, we're all about, like, this robust, like, sort of local identity wrapped up in our commitment to jesus christ like how do we how do we so to speak like think of our place in society as a sort of tribe but as different than than groups that we want to say like no that is pernicious you know on our our, our culture that's a great that's a great question and it's it's the it's the part of the article you know that i that i wrote five years ago that that i would definitely kind of i would add some complications to now because i was basically still writing from within liberalism, I was still. I, my argument then was, if you want more autonomy, this is how you get it: not through the administrative state, but through robust, um, robust civil society. Um, but uh, but the common good does demand a robust state to some degree because it the, the common good demands, um, uh, especially in the modern era, I think. You know, a state that can pursue the common, that can um, pursue and ensure the common good, um, and that you know, it, it, it's it's more complicated than just saying, "Oh, let a million flowers bloom," because that falls yeah. into precisely the lack of teleology, falls into precisely the lack of of um, of uh, orderedness, of of uh, of freedom that that you fall into with the individualism. Um, so. So how do we think of ourselves in this in this moment? I mean, the 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 um, I think the temptation in a moment of of um, the reassertion of clan like identities, where, for instance, I'm expected by virtue of being a white conservative Catholic male, I'm expected to um, to support in, in any way I can Brett Kavanaugh um, because he has now become in the public consciousness a kind of avatar for people like me. And if I don't support him, it's a kind of treason. Um, and I'm not, 
I'm not saying whether or not I support him, I, but I'm telling you that, you know, there's this sense of um, that uh, that we are we have duties based on these. I don't want to say emerging identities, but re-emerging, re-emerging uh, identities. Yeah, and on that um, note, Brandon, we're actually coming up yeah. against the break, so sorry sure. to like in, intervene with like uh, actual, you know, market realities. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we're going to go to break, and when we get back, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll pick up right on that note of what you're saying about these uh, re-emerging identities. This is the uncommon good. Yeah. We'll be back after this break. Folks, if you had the chance to make it to the Chrysler Life Conference, it was quite a thing. It makes sense that it takes two years to prepare for this. And if you want to uh, chime in about how it went or have any ideas or just want to share with others about how much you enjoyed the time there on Facebook, Iowa Catholic Radio, and our Twitter handle is at IA Catholic Radio, at IA Catholic Radio. Um, there's Instagram, too. I'm only now figuring that out. Ask a, a, a millennial that is in within arm's reach, and they'll tell you how to do the Instagram stuff. Uh, you can also sign up for our email, uh, where we keep you up to date on everything that's happening throughout the diocese. And half the time, uh, you can just go ahead and sign up for it right there. Uh, so Facebook, Iowa Catholic Radio. Twitter handle, at IA Catholic Radio. Sign up for our email, and that's how you can keep track of what's going on at the diocese. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back after these messages. Thank you, Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, for underwriting Catholic Women Now. As an authorized independent agent, Cindy's team can provide health insurance options from Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. Cindy Schulte at 1315 50th Street in West Des Moines or on the web at cindyschulte.com. 515-226-2111. Cindy and her team know health insurance. Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa is an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Products available at Farm Bureau Financial Services. Hi, this is Chris Stefanik from Real Life Catholic, inviting you to join me live for Reboot. Don't just stay where you are, get where you want to be. Come discover the life-changing, inspiring, powerful experience of applying the beauty of the gospel, the best news ever, to every part of your life, so you can live the life you were made for. Jesus didn't come to make you boring, he came to give you life to the full. That's Thursday, October 18th at Ames City Auditorium in Ames, Iowa. Get your tickets at reallifecatholic.com. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies, including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400, and online at cartridgeworld.com. Why give to the Catholic Tuition Organization? To help families who want to send their kids to our Catholic schools and just can't afford it. Some donors like to give part or all of their required minimum distribution from their retirement account. The 65% Iowa tax credit you receive are a tax benefit you just don't want to pass up. Ask your tax advisor or contact us online, ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr having on with us today, Uncommon Good All-Star Brandon McGinley. Brandon, thanks for joining the show again. Yeah, no problem. So one of the things uh, we were talking about at the, sort of the, start, at the top of the show is this deep cut track you wrote about individualism that we're pointing out that even though there are things you would change in 2018, it's only become more and more relevant, how individualism pervades so much of what we do. I was thinking about this. We, we'll get back to your, your idea about that because of how we've set up our understanding of the state, it, it, all, it, it, was, it was bound to fall back into this clannish identity driven fight that we find ourselves in today. Um, but you made a really interesting point that I think uh, gives some meat to this bones. You, you said the idea used to be that if we could just let a thousand flowers bloom, we wouldn't have to worry about the, the over-pressing of the state. But then the more we learn about the common good uh, in Catholic social teaching is there is a role for the state. And the state not only has like a role, it has a very important one talking about ordering to the common good and it's not the state itself that's the problem but a state that acts like it's this sort of like neutral thing overhanging everything i have a, a contemporary example uh 
you know, not to cast too many aspersions to get all wrapped up in like which candidates we like or not or who's in, but for the the time being, there's just the sheer fact that there's a lot of uh, offices within the executive branch of the United States government that cur- currently are not filled. One of them mm-hmm. is the National Weather Service, which <laughs> uh, they did an article about this. They didn't fill it forever. Now there's all these like hurricanes hitting. The National Weather Service obviously is something that we all benefit from, knowing when storms are coming. Um, but the guy who's currently heading it owns AccuWeather, which is the app weather service competing against the National Weather Service. Right? <laughs> and and so beyond the fact of like, I'm sure there's some people that are like, well, good, a businessman's in there, he'll make it better. There's at least obviously this idea that like that guy has at least some conflicting motives about how to properly right. do this. And so when you get back to this, to shred, like to, again, to, to, to stop looking about it in terms of like who's in office and who might be, there's this question of if we have the resources, is it for the common good to have a national weather service? And if it is, which I think it is, and I'm from Oklahoma, we get hit by tornadoes a lot, you yeah. start to go, well, okay, sure, the government spends money on that, which is our tax dollars, but sur- surely there's things that if we're capable – we want the government to do it. But the the thing is, is we want the government to do it because that's ordered to the common good, not because it increases our freedom or our liberty. And I think that starts to be the real question is, you know, w- what do we think a government does? And actually, a government in the Catholic social teaching will have coercive power. Like, people don't like this idea, right. but yeah, like, it will. That's the idea of it protecting itself, for instance. But it's like we've skewed the ability to talk about it so much that the National Weather Service, instead of being a discussion of the common good, now is like subsumed into which clan do you belong to? And has this clan taken the National Weather Service as one of the hills it wants to die on? And that is just a a wackadoodle understanding of governance. Right, right. Yeah, um, I think, you know, the... um the uh, once you once you I, I, I got yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna back up and what I'm gonna say is that the ironic thing is that uh, or the kind of the par- use that word again the paradoxical thing is that um, the state that claims to be neutral ends up being more oppressive at least in some senses than the state. That um, than the state that that genuinely and forthrightly pursues some some sort of good. Um, that doesn't mean that, that not in all cases a, a state that pursues a deeply you know an evil form of, of what they believe to be good right. is ultimately the worst uh, the worst of all. However, the the neutral state the, the state that claims to be neutral ends up pursuing goods. First of all, ends up it ends up suppressing goods in the name of neutrality right that's a good Um, yes yes yep go ahead and yeah and so and so and and it ends up suppressing it ends up suppressing uh and and, and it doesn't it doesn't say what it's doing it it, when it when it's doing that it's it's, it is pursuing some something that is perceived to be a, a by by people a um a substantive commitment to uh to 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 the good um, as as the state or as the people running the state see it, but it pretends that it isn't. Um, and then I, I think this kind of you know back to like the National Weather Service thing. Um, whenever you whenever you have lost the ability to talk about the common good because we're so used to this idea of neutrality, because we're so used to pretending like the state isn't pursuing some kind of good, because that's kind of you know a, a, it's a um, it's kind of a little white lie we've uh, we've all agreed to tell about about the state. That's how you end up with situations like this, where we can't we can't since we can't talk about the common good because we have lost the vocabulary. All you're left with is political power. Yep. All you're left with is who can assert themselves um, in the most efficient way. And the 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 classical liberal counter argument is. No, we can't pursue some some sort of substantive good because, um, or at least I shouldn't say the classical liberals. Because the classical liberals would have some some idea of the good. But kind of the modern liberal pushback would be, it's no, we can't pursue some some uh, um, 
substantive version of the good because that would be um, dangerous. Um, but no, it's not just about power because we have procedures <laughs> right. that we must all respect, which, is, which goes back to the Kavanaugh thing. A lot of the discussion is, oh, these procedures, no one's respecting the process, blah, 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 blah. No one's respecting the process ever. Yeah. It's just more obvious now. <laughs> right. And procedures uh, and laws become tools for whoever yeah. is able to use them. And that's... Right. And, yeah. It's, it, and it's like you said, it's a, it, you hide behind something, and then the thing you're hiding behind, you're using the shield as a weapon, too, like if that's the metaphor. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. Brandon, um, so uh, let me see if I can put words in your mouth and you tell me if I'm being fair or not. <laughs> we talked uh, earlier, like, with uh, we were joking about the photo of you standing in front of the American flag. And um, I know you were involved in some ways in more like what we'd call like conventional politics when you were younger. And mm-hmm. now I think listeners might hear us talking on the show and talking about like these foundational topics and think like, these guys are just idealists, but it would never work out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I, and I guess what I'm driving at is, like, Catholics would be the last people, I think, who would think about withdrawal, like, we're going we're gonna to be sectarian and step away. But I feel like one point that, that you press in your writings and that we've tried to bring up on the show is, like, we, we need to be wary about just accepting the terms that are already on the playing field. And, yeah. you know, folks will say, like, well, something like integralism or this way of, of ordering our, our society to the common good, that's just impossible. It's not realistic but if the last few years have taught us anything is like this idea that there's an end to history or that things are inevitably going to lo- work out a certain way that's just not true you know yeah i mean you know i i get a little frustrated by that because like the idea that we are going to capture the mechanisms of the american government for catholicism um <laughs> you know but by by the the kind of traditional means um seems to me just as just as or the idea that 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 we are going to uh the idea that we're going to become members of a coalition that does so that actually has authority within that coalition instead of just being pawns of that coalition that seems to me to be just as if not more far-fetched than uh than um you know discussions of uh like you said integralism or whatever um and uh yeah you know um we were talking before the break about you know, how do you how do you square a Catholic identity with this new identitarianism that's, that's kind of all the rage, and and I think that you know and I was talking about how you know we need to be wary. Of emphasis all the on rage, on by the way. Them. Sorry, emphasis on rage. I had to say that joke. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, and and I was thinking about that, and you know, yes, you know, Catholicism is in part an identity. Uh, it's an identity in Christ. And it is a transcendent identity, whereas the identities that are on offer today, race and uh, and uh, gender and so on and so forth, are politically and culturally and socially contingent. And that's where we have to be careful: is we're being offered uh, we're being offered, you know, kind of a, a bill of goods. We're being offered um, all of these uh, all of these contingent identities with the promise that if we find on to the right coalition of identities, our Catholic identity might have a seat at the table. But that conflates the certain kind of tribalism that Catholicism is. You know, you think of St. Paul, you know, honor all men, love the brotherhood. We have a special duty to our our fellow Catholics. However, it's a diff- it's it's extremely different from the kind of duties that are currently being worked out uh, and articulated on the basis of race and ethnicity and, and all that, which are um, extremely problematic, to say the least. Um, but just because we have a notion in Catholic, uh, uh, in, um, in Church teaching, of, of the kind of special duties to your fellows, doesn't mean that that can be extrapolated um, from the special duties we have to our to fellow Catholics to your special duties to other white people and things like that that, that are increasingly being articulated with impunity in yeah. a way that had not been for a long time. Well, and what's interesting about this is, to use another political metaphor to talk about this, it's like Catholicism, we're trying to make it a rider to a different bill, right? So, yeah. like, we're going to... 
we're going to stake our claim with European identity, white identity, male, female, like going all the way down. All the things, funny enough, right. that Paul said Christ has overcome in himself. We're now right. trying to attach Catholicism as a writer with it and saying, like, well, if this wins and cashes out, then everything we say about the church will cash out too, which right. seems to be exactly the opposite of what um, we're saying if we believe that Christ has conquered the world through the cross. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's almost like we're not giving Christ victory enough credit to think that we can't outlast the current shenanigans, how they exist. And, and that's what I think I'd go back to. And, and like to, to Bud's question is I think we have to call into question what th- does this work mean? So they go, well, what you're talking about will never work. But every day I wake up on the news and read Twitter and I go like, uh, Lord, if this is what working is defined as, I mean, what is not working going to look like? I mean, like, maybe I don't understand how chaotic chaos can be, but if this is the the way things work, I'm like, maybe I should just be a wacky idealist that says things because I'm not impressed in any way uh, with anything that's being offered up as working. Yeah. It, yeah, to the extent it's working, it, it is working for a, a wholly culturalized Catholicism, um, a Catholicism that is based entirely, entirely on contingent identities um, and and um, and uh, kind of um, culturally, historically conditioned notions of what it means to be Catholic right right now, which in the U.S. involves a lot of things like Christmas trees and. Um, <laughs> And um, you know, saying Merry Christmas at Target and things like that, um, rather than the transcendent identity we have in Christ. Well, but even if it's like politics, this is politics working. Like that's, they, you know, they they try to sell us a, a bill of goods and say if you Christians will just behave, you can be part of this like well-oiled machine. And I'm like, where's the well-oiled machine? Right. Yeah. Right. What, what benefits are you actually throwing on the table? And I mean. I, first among anyone, will say that sometimes I get tired of my own group, like us, sometimes being like the whiny Catholics that are like, we're just a few moments away from being like, uh, our heads on pikes, right? Like, that's not happening. Right. We have this radio show, etc. cetera. Um, right, right. But, but I will say, on the other hand, that when, uh, just as much as I say that, when people go like, well, you know, if you just do A, B, and C, you can be a part of this, like, grand society, I'm like... This society, A, it hardly looks like a society anymore, and B, grand is uh, basically false advertising because what you say works so well is just crumbling. Not like, like I don't think we're going to be like Mad Max in two years, but like I think at some point we're all going to have to be like, no, 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 this is all naked political power, and yeah. y- y- you know we we just can't have the facade anymore. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, and that's. You know, you know, we we went through again not to not to dwell on the Supreme Court thing, but that's exactly what we're seeing right now. I mean, you know, there we we had we had we had taken steps down this road in the past with Clarence Thomas, of course, and Robert Bork, but now now we're at the point where there's there's really no or very little facade left. I mean, everybody knows this is just a question, uh, with the exception of a few idealists left in the Senate who are like trying to give people political fig leaves and blah 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 blah, blah in order to be able to, uh, you know, cast votes. But at the end of the day, it's a question, do you have the votes? And if you have the votes, you win. Um, and regardless of what actually happened at Georgetown Prep in the 1980s, regardless of anything else, all of this is, I mean, it's, it's important culturally and socially, but when it comes to the actual, when it comes to the question of, you know, will, um, you know, will Brett Kavanaugh be confirmed, it's wholly a question of, can you marshal the power? And then the question is, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it to, is it worth it to, to uh, uh, you know, as specifically as Catholics, is it worth it to, um, to, to become shills for, um, uh, for whatever, uh, um, whatever power coalition is offering us apparently a seat at the table at any given moment? And, you know that that for me, you know, historically has has never seemed to actually work out as much as it seems to, and even in, even if it did work out better than it has in the past, what are the costs? What are the costs in faithfulness? What are the costs in authentic Catholic identity in seeing ourselves 
having a transcendent identity rather than just an American political and cultural identity. What are the costs in evangelism? What are the costs in the in in what other people think being a Catholic means? Does it mean going to the wall for whatever um, uh, for whatever uh, Supreme Court nominee um, may or may not uh, kind of sort of promise to do about Roe v. Wade? Um, or does it mean something more than that? Um, and I think at the end of the day, the ca- I, at the end of the day, uh, at least right now, the way American politics functions, and I think for the foreseeable future, um, the long-term costs, in winning short-term battles are extreme. Yeah, Brandon, what excites me about all this and, and thinking about politics in this way, we're up against the clock, but I mean, I just, I guess I would just close with like, um, I, what's great about this is that uh, it sort of, um, it, uh, it, it empowers us to do things like, I'm not, I'm not being very articulate here at all, but like not everything rests on like a single moment every four years. And right. so you have the opportunity, like, I guess you could, you could talk about a lot of these things and be frozen, like, and just enter into this paralysis. Like, we have the opportunity right now to do all sorts of things at different levels that are truly um, beneficial for the polis. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we've painted a bleak picture. But mm-hmm. I think it's actually an incredible opportunity because... Mm-hmm. The, as we said, the facade is coming down. We're seeing the way politics actually works. Um, the idea of neutrality is, is, has, in the space of just a few years, gone from being the prevailing assumption of the way we think about our government to almost totally gone. Um, That's right. Or to the extent yeah. it's there, it's just, you know, it's a few columns in, in, you know, in mainstream newspapers just lamenting the problem of polarization and blah, 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 which is... I don't mean to I don't mean to dismiss it, but you know what they're talking about is not polarization per se. It's that their preferred alternative is no longer on the table. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so and so I, I I think that it's actually a really great opportunity to detach ourselves not from the political life of our country and our communities because that's it's important to to be engaged in whatever way is, is prudent. Um, that's part of the common good, but. It, I think it's an outstanding opportunity to detach ourselves from the, um, the the traditional and prevailing notions of what a Catholic must do politically in order to get on, get on in this country. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think finally, yeah, to ra- to wrap up, like I think what we can say is like now we don't have to like hide that like we want to do something because we're Catholic, right? If it's yeah. if if we don't need to talk about a facade anymore, when people go like, well, why do you want to do this bill? You'll be like, oh, I think that the church tells me to, and if you're yeah, going to be. Yeah out front about it we can too and maybe that's what we all need mm-hmm. yeah so. absolutely and, and and it will be it'll be hard and there'll be conflict and and i think that we're looking at a time of 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 uh of instability but in some ways it's not so much instability but but recognizing the instability that's already there and yeah. applying it to more people <laughs> well brandon right. uh brandon mcginley it's great talking to you like i said uh all-star that's been on our show many times we have to have him many more times in the future brandon thanks for coming on the show yeah no problem guys appreciate it all right thanks brandon brandon mcginley writes all over the place if you put in brandon mcginley uh you will see a cornucopia of places you can read and you can do either read his most uh, no- uh recent stuff or do what bo uh, bud does and find things he wrote like in uh 1987 when he was eight or whatever so well if you if you go to brandon dot com, he's got it all cataloged there so, you go there you go yeah <laughs> well this, thanks again brandon this is the uncommon good uh with bo bonner dr bud marr uh may jesus christ the prince of peace reign in our hearts in our families in our cities our state our country the world the galaxy everywhere the uncommon good will be back next wednesday god bless <laughs> But it's about that time of year again when we are going to do the Carathon. We have set um, a pretty large goal, I'd say, 120000 Um I, for instance, would take 120000 if anyone wants to give it. 120000 though, of course, is not to buy John Leonetti's pumpkin spice lattes. We really insist on this every year that you realize none of the money goes to John Leonetti's pumpkin spice lattes. What it goes to is you being a part of this ministry that reaches souls 24-7, that spans... Uh, southern Iowa that goes through walls that, that penetrates not only physical walls uh, through airwaves, but also the walls of people's hardened hearts. So many people have talked about what Iowa Catholic Radio has done for them, and the Carathon is a chance for you to be a part of these ministries. 
Yeah, Carathon coming up next week. Um, we'd encourage you, you know, to listen to Iowa Catholic Radio throughout the day. You can start the morning off right, 5 a.m., Bible in a year. There's rosary at 5.30 and 9.30 each day, 9.30 p.m., that is. And then, uh, you know, Bud, we're, we're working on it, um, but uh, we're, we think that we might actually have uh, technology that will allow you to sound as crystal clear as John Leonetti uh, instead of over the phone. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but until that, um, don't chow down too much on your uh, french fries and uh, lettuce in anxiety. But, uh, you know, just wanted to keep you on board there, bud. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I try not to chomp fries during the show, but I'll, <laughs> I'll think about some vocal cord exercises as well. That's right. So um, also coming up uh, October 27th, we have The Great Schism of Church Divided by Charles Yost. Uh, a talk for the Diocese of Des Moines Catholic Culture Lecture Series. Like I said, we also have on October 18th, the Faith and Healing uh, Lecture Series at Mercy College of Health Sciences. So much that you can do, so much to see. Uh, www.iowacatholicradio.com. Iowa, Iowa Catholic Radio on Facebook, at IA Catholic Radio for our Twitter handle. Uh, for Bud Marr, this is Bo Bonner. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll see you next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good.